missing shoe, but that's okay. Well, you just tell me when you want me to advance them. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for your patience as we were having some technical difficulties with our platform today. Um, I want to um, just remind everybody you're in listening mode. And um, if you have any questions, please utilize the chat. Um, I am going to introduce you to Dr. Jason Chen. I'm so happy that he's here with us today. Um, he, Dr. Chen graduated from the University of Virginia, received his doctorate in osteopath osteopathic medicine degree from Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine in uh, 2008. Following the completion of his family medicine residency um, at the University of Maryland, Dr. Chen practiced fam uh, primary care at Penn Medicine Valley Forge um, in inpatient medicine and the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania at Chestnut Hill Hospital. Um, in 2013, Dr. Chen completed training in acupuncture through Harvard Medi uh, School of Medicine, transitioning to John Hopkins in 2014. He's continued teaching and practicing primary care, osteopathic, manual medicine, and acupuncture, while notably establishing the first integrative medical practice at John Hopkins, which is amazing. Um, Dr. Chen is, has a passion for teaching and is an instructor for the medicine um, instructor of medicine at John Hopkins School, um, Hopkins School of Medicine and the assistant professor at the George Washington University School of Medicine. Um, he believes in the body's ability to, to heal itself and is committed to supporting the body's self-healing homeostatic processes because he believes that each and every body is fearful and woefully made um, he is an integrative osteopathic physician who's excited to join the amazing team of Vibrant and bring his passion of whole person care and teaching to the next generation of physicians, healthcare providers, and leaders. We are so honored to have him today. And please, everyone, bear with us. Um, we, I have Dr. Chen actually on speakerphone, so you'll be hearing him. Um, and I'm going to be advancing the slides, and we are just going to do our very best. And I'm so excited for this presentation. So over to you, Dr. Chen. Thank you, Dr. Bruno, for the kind introduction. Can everybody hear me okay? I think so. Yeah, we're okay. getting some thumbs up, so Great. that's good. All right. Perfect. Great. Thank you very much. And I just really am glad to be able to share the insights that we can all grow together and learn together for the oxidative stress panel that, that Vibrant's introducing is truly groundbreaking and I'm excited to get behind uh, the, the amazing team that's doing this this very important work. And so Dr. Stagg and Dr. Bruno have already done an amazing job introducing us to oxidative stress. And so today I'm really going to focus on the cardiovascular system and impacts of oxidative stress on the cardiovascular system. And after that, I'm going to present a live case. This actually just happened. The patient came in for hospital follow-up yesterday. So as we say, it's uh, hot off the press, <laughs> very fresh. So today, uh, we're, we'll just start briefly since you already covered this, but just to get our, our bearings uh, on the first slide, what is oxidative stress? So as, as this name implies, oxidative, oxidative stress occurs when the body is in a state of stress or inflammation, and there's an imbalance between generation buildup of reactive oxygen species and the body's ability to eliminate these reactive byproducts through both innate biological systems and dietary antioxidants. I like to explain it to my patients, like if you take a bite out of an apple and then you leave it on the table, what happens? Well, the apple turns brown, right? So this is always happening in the body. We remember back to chemistry between oxida oxi <clears throat> the oxidation and reduction uh, reactions. And so it's kind of like this concept that the body has what, what we call a biological 401k, so many assets to deal with stressors, with cancer cells, with oxidative stress. And so um, this is going to be an exciting way for us to be able to more precisely quantify individuals' personal uh, oxidative stress profile. And you'll see this in our case. Uh, so let's talk about the, the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, and so which one? Basically, this one? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, Thank perfect. you. Sorry. 
So, no, no, it's perfect. Thank you. So, as we know, there was a Johns Hopkins study that looked at the impact of modifiable lifestyle factors and the environment, as well as genetics. And we now know that uh, through the work of people like Dr. Gene Ornish, that optimizing modifiable lifestyle factors, especially in the context of a social network and incorporating things like mindfulness-based stress reduction and community can really not just reduce risk of cancer, but can actually turn on tumor suppressor gene uh, and tumor suppressor. So it's not just focusing on tumor promoters, but also tumor suppressors that our body is always uh, kind of, I, I call it the cleanup crew. Like when you're on the highway, uh, like Dr. Bruno, I like to use metaphors, but you know, it's like you're driving sometimes late at night after a long shift for those of us that work night shifts and you see these construction workers from, from the department of transportation working well, that's, that's our body's, um, way of cleaning up senescent cells. And so all this emerging interest and research into senolytic therapies, as well as killing cancer cells. And that's why sleep is so important. And we'll talk a little bit about the impact of the COVID long haul or the post COVID era and its impact on microcirculation as we proceed. Great. So can we go to the next slide, please? And so we'll just quick, quickly again, go over these because you've already, uh, Dr. Bruno and Dr. Stagg did a great job of introducing all of these, but, um, there's always this balance between kind of norm normal healthy cellular processes and then things like oxidative stress and things like exposures to toxins and environmental triggers. And back to that Hopkins study that is thought to be roughly an impact of the rule of three. So say a third is going to be environmental and then a third is going to be genetic and then a third is going to be lifestyle. So you might have someone like George Burns who comes into your office and is smoking a hundred packs of cigarettes a day and is not exercising and is sedentary, but happens to be able to mitigate his personal cancer risk through genetics. And this is why it's exciting to be in the era of personalized medicine, where it's not just the book of life, the ACGT sequences, and then base pair substitutions and deletions and so forth that leads to PKU and cystic fibrosis. But we're actually at a point where we can interpret the genetics and really delve into people's genomics from RNA to DNA to protein expression. And so that's what we really want to uh, stress today and, and make that a, a major take home point. So May we please go to the next slide? Thank you very much. And so, as we know, um, metal toxicity can lead to free radical formation and certainly things like dental amalgams, um, which, which I have personally had removed. Uh, it's not going to be one stressor, as I explained to patients. It can be that uh, straw that breaks the camel's back, right? Your body is faithfully trying to uh, deal with the uh, stressors and that those debits, as I said, on the biological 401k and, and credits being things like sleeping, things like good social relationships, how we eat, how we think, how we move, all these modifiable lifestyle factors. But in today's era, especially where we have sleep fragmentation, disruption of social networks, um, you know, I'm seeing commonly, and I'm sure many of you have too, uh, people who are not just running on empty driving down the highway, their their gas tank has a hole in it and the wheels are falling off the bus. And, and yet we're in this, without going into too much of a tangent, a kind of high performance, high stress, high octane, bigger, better, faster. And so oftentimes I have to kind of take my own pulse, as they say on the airplane, check your own, you know, put your oxygen mask on. Even for those of us that are parents, you put, put the oxygen mask on yourself before you're able to help others. And so... Yes, um, let's move to the next slide, please. And so briefly, the endogenous and exogenous sources, many sources, as, as you know, that can be associated with uh, increased reactive oxygen species formation. And ultimately, as you can see from this slide, uh, effect ultimately DNA and RNA and protein expression. And so let's go to the next slide, please. So. I think it's very important that we see, and um, this is kind of a little personal uh, 
background for me, I mean, certainly as a DO sitting at Johns Hopkins and thinking this is like the mecca of professional achievement, uh, almost going to the NFL of medicine and sitting at that bridge thinking how far we came as a profession, but um, always being driven by this belief that, you know, we're fearfully and wonderfully made and that our body is so faithful to do so much every day, even just to wake up. It's a miracle. And so much is still not understood despite advances in neuroimaging and volumetric analysis and fMRIs and QEEGs. And for those of us that are kind of into more um, neurologic rehabilitation and recovery practices, um, this slide is, is particularly important to me uh, because in functional medicine, I noticed a similar pattern that that has happened in, fun in, in, in conventional medicine, where let's say I was at uh, Hopkins and I would see patients who had a history of Lyme disease and maybe, um, you know, various courses of antibiotics, maybe IDSA would have them take some septin or doxycycline and they'll take it for a couple of weeks, but then they would have these persistent uh, symptoms. And then we had, um, you know, at Hopkins, you have every subspecialty clinic you could imagine at the click of an epic button. And so I do a referral to the Lyme Clinic and I get to refer to Dr. Alcott, who is one of the thought leaders in Lyme. You know, if I wanted to refer to a mixed connective special uh, tissue disorder or mixed connective tissue disorder specialist uh, within rheumatology or pediatric rheumatology, I was able to do that. But for me, I was very here when I went to Hopkins that I wanted to create an integrative medical practice with other integrative uh, minded docs. For example, Dr. Mullen, as you know, is the head of GI and is also one of the leading IFM faculty. And so I, I was able to collaborate. And when people did a referral to integrative medicine, well, my name popped up because I was the only one doing integrative medicine from a primary care setting. So I, I still remember getting to treat a patient who was 13 months old and was already on a respir uh, respirator and a feeding tube. Um, and she was coming to our clinic, uh, getting acupuncture as part of her make a wish, um, uh, kind of make a wish, um, I guess, path for lack of a better term. And, and I, I realized that this was so, so heartbreaking because prevention shouldn't be the last stop on the line, right? It should be the first stop. But unfortunately, as we know, it's kind of reversed. And I saw this at UPenn too, where you have a bunch of people that have already been diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. They're already on their ostomy. So there's not much else to do. So then you just refer them to integrated medicine. But I'm hoping that all of us here with our combined talents, I understand from uh, Elisa, Dr. Bruna and Susie that we have quite an assembly of talent here. I think of it as assembling the Avengers. And so if we really work together we can really move the needle, not just in terms of a N of one kind of concept or rallying cry, but a, a real sh a change where in 10 to 15 years, this will be the standard of care. And so returning back to this, as, as we can see, it's not enough just to use labs from the 1970s and lipid biomarkers developed um, to look at the risk for a 26 year old with chest pain and maybe some minor and major risk factors as an 85 year old with a history of diabetes and maybe vascular remodeling and cardiometabolic syndrome and apple and these kinds of things. So these studies show you that the biomarkers and imaging do not always correlate with the actual manifestation and presentation of disease. And so we can proceed to the next slide. Thank you very much. And so this is a brief review, um, as we know that we can actually check the intimal medial thickening uh, and that low risk would be CIMTs of less than 0 0.9 millimeters, whereas intermediate would be between 1 to 1 1.5 millimeters and high risk being one point, uh, greater than 1.5 millimeters. Of course, these cutoff values are not set in stone and can differ between studies and guidelines. And so this is just another tool in our toolkit that we can use to kind of risk stratify uh, individuals because we know that oxidative stress as from our previous slides 
uh, is associated in the development and progression of atherosclerosis, endothelial dysfunction, lipid peroxidation, and inflammation, and that increased oxidative stress markers, markers do correlate with CIMT progression and are associated with adverse cardiovascular outcomes in individuals with atherosclerosis. So from a prevention standpoint, we can definitely monitor CIMT to provide valuable information about individuals' cardiovascular risk profile to help optimize and guide preventative um, strategies for our patients. And by detecting increased CIMT, that can help us really focus on the important lifestyle modifications for that person. Because everyone knows to eat Mediterranean, everybody knows to cut down processed foods and to eat organic based on these days, the clean 15 and the dirty dozen, but everybody has a different pain point. And so it's a real blessing to be able to have more than 15 minutes or five minutes to really hear and gather the information and make sure that we have the story straight by the time the patient gets to see us. Uh, maybe go to the next slide, please. Thank you. And so there is definitely a, a pathophysiological connection between uh, the development of atherosclerosis and kind of a force multiplier that can occur when you have obesity because of, as we know, the inflammatory role of adipose tissue, especially visceral versus subcutaneous adipose tissue. Atherosclerosis, the, the, the harbinger event is the retention and oxidative modification of LDL where oxidized LDL basically causes foam cells to proliferate, triggering the pro-inflammatory cascade that you see here, and proliferation of smooth muscle cells as the plaque progresses. As I tell my patients, your vascular system is not a static hose. Uh, it, it, there are so there's so much going on in terms of um, you know we know about the roles of nitric oxide we know about the caliber of small vessels as we'll soon discuss and microcirculation and its impact on macrocirculation and so it's vascular remodeling that doesn't happen overnight right all of these things again back to that biological 401k it's like people are in the red for so long and and their body is telling them through a combination of biomarkers and or symptoms, uh, which may not always happen. It could be, again, silent killers, as we know. Um, but I really believe that cardiovascular disease and cancer, which are a leading cause of morbidity and mortality in the United States and globally are fully preventable, especially with a lot of tools, such as the one we're discussing today. So I'm super excited about it. Let's move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so this is kind of further underscoring more studies that we can look at in the interest of time. And so again, we have uh, the impact of hypox hypoxemia um, on cardiovascular morbidity or mortality. And so anything that we can do to increase uh, end organ perfusion um, and anything we can do to improve blood flow and to improve vascular health will ultimately improve outcomes for our patients, which is clearly demonstrated in the literature. Um, so before we go on to the next slide, I just quickly wanted to say that uh, back to the earlier slide on reactive oxygen species, this again carries forward here because we know that ROS, reactive oxygen species, can impair endothelial function by reducing the bioavailability of nitric oxide, which, as we know, is a key regulator of vascular tone and function, leading to just downstream terrible results, endothelial dysfunction and vascular disease that the body just simply cannot handle uh, on its own, and it might require additional micronutrient support and intravenous therapies. And so we'll discuss some of those. But... Um, we already discussed the um, inflammatory uh, participation of oxidized LDL, knowing that it's high, highly atherogenic and, again, is associated with foam wall formation in the arterial cell and vascular remodeling and ultimately development of atherosclerosis. And so this is well documented in the literature. So let's move on next, please. Thank you. Okay. So... Again, more of the same things. I think we've covered this, but I just wanted to, sometimes we have uh, just multiple ways of saying the same thing. And so we uh, know the physiologic processes underpinning what we're trying to 
trying to achieve. And so let's move on to the next slide, please. Uh, the role of the glycocalyx. So this is really exciting because we know uh, from, from biochem about the glycocalyx, that it's a gel-like layer covering the luminal surface. This kind of goes back to what I was saying, that it's a very dynamic, uh, constantly changing uh, environment. It's very vibrant, uh, since we're talking with vibrant labs here, that's composed of multiple uh, glycoproteins, proteoglycans, and glycosaminoglycans that forms a dynamic interface between circulating blood and the vessel wall. So you can see here, this is uh, on the on images on the right, you've got uh, electron microscopy kind of um, visualization of what this actually looks like. And you can see that it is a selective barrier that basically kind of like the gut and the digestive system controls the passage of molecules and cells between the bloodstream and the vessel wall, allowing for nutrient exchange, hormones and inflammatory mediators uh, to move uh, as, as they need to. I, I like to describe this as the highway, if you look at, say, Highway 25, where we are in Colorado, you know, the traditional labs from the 70s are looking at the number of passengers. So it's looking at LDL and HDL and triglycerides, uh, maybe VLDL. However, it's not looking at things that we need to, to stratify, as we'll see in the case, which are inflammatory markers and apolipoproteins, which are well documented in the literature. And so those actually show us not just the number of cars that are carrying the passengers that lead to traffic jams and therefore ischemia and therefore end organ uh, oxygen deprivation and ultimately tissue death. Um, this will allow us to, to see and, and make the necessary factors to either add another highway when you're putting patients on things like omegas uh, and things like a B complex and reducing homocysteine and vascular stress markers and so forth. But uh, we can discuss that further. And of course, if there's questions at the end, I'll be happy to elaborate further. But the first role, as I discussed, is barrier function of the glycocalyx. The second is me mechanotransduction. And the third is antithrombosis. So mechano mechanotransduction simply means that as you can imagine, as we'll see in our case, when you have somebody that's having significantly elevated blood pressures, they may not be in the hypertensive urgency or emergency range, but that causes sheer stress over time that can have the cumulative uh, damage effect that is going to affect trend, um, the way that mechanical signals and blood flow uh, ultimately uh, perfuse the endothelial cells. And that a downstream cascade effect on intracellular signaling pathways and vascular tone regulation, permeability, and remodeling in response to hemodynamic forces. So that's mechanotransduction uh, function of the glycocalyx. The third is the antithrombotic properties. So glycocalyx plays a critical role in maintaining hemostasis by preventing platelet adhesion and aggregation on the endothelial surfaces, right? When we get a cut, or it, let's say it's even a deep laceration, our body is immediately starting to sound the alarm, SOS, inflammatory cascade and cytokines leading to, as we remember, the hematologic cascade, thromboxane and so forth, interleukins and cytokines. And so this process is the body's normal physiologic response to repair, but ultimately longstanding inflammation causes again an overload in our body's capacity and ability, therefore, to respond to stressors. Um, if your balance is empty for too long, you're, you might start getting electricity and utilities turned off. You might not feel it for a while, but eventually you will notice and your body will tell you, even if it's an emergency room visit. And so um, there's physiology, physiology, which we don't need to go down into, but the critical takeaway for antithrombosis is Again, I want to underscore preventing platelet adhesion and aggregation. And so what can we please move to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so importance of the oxidative stress and the glycocalyx um, in vascular health and, and implications and how do we address um, and assess the actual glycocalyx integrity and function. And so, as we've already seen, oxidative stress has multiple uh, detrimental profound impacts on the glycocalyx that can lead to not just hemodynamic changes in the acute setting, but in the chronic setting, structural and fu functional alterations 
of the actual intrinsic structure of the glycocalyx by damaging the, the glycocalyx compounds, the glycoproteins and the glycosaminoglycans that impairs their integrity and function. So again, think about the highway. If you have a little pothole, that's okay. But if that pothole isn't repaired, it can lead to the point where the deeper excavation and structure uh, repair has to be done uh, to to rebuild that highway. And so that's that's another way that I like to tie it to the patients. And so ultimately, what we want to prevent in the in the long game is to prevent the the vascular permeability. Kind of again, like the uh, the, the leaky gut, you have a bunch of uh, we'll say bad actors that are able to permeate um, the vascular space and uh, promote extra extravasation of inflammatory cells and macromolecules into surrounding tissues. And so it's very important that we're able to assess the glycocalyx. One way is through intravital microscopy, and this allows the direct visualization of the glycocalyx and living tissues, providing insights into the structures and dynamics in real time. You also have glycocalyx biomarkers that you can check, Syndicam-1, Hyaluronin, and Lipocam-1. They're actually released into circulation upon glycocalyx degradation. And so elevated levels of these biomarkers are an indicator of glycocalyx, uh, glycocalyx damage and endothelial dysfunction. Uh, lastly, you can measure the glycocalyx thickness using imaging modalities such as dark field imaging, uh, intravascular ultrasound, and then you can actually quantify the glycocalyx thickness, and that gives you valuable information about its status and, and potential alterations in disease states. And so basically the takeaway is that the oxidative stress can profoundly impact the glycocalyx and compromise endothelial barrier function, contributing to vascular dysfunction and disease. And so it's essential that we are able to know what tools that are available uh, to be able to target and understand role in the individual's vascular pathophysiology and then help develop them uh, help them develop targeted therapeutic interventions to preserve vascular health. Okay, so can we go to the next slide, please? Um, and this kind of again shows you the it's kind of a combination of the previous slide, but this is a kind of a vicious cycle that we are able to stop through a variety of methods or at least mitigate. And so I like to use diagrams um, worth a thousand words, but those are kind of the, the, the foundation and then the illustration. And so the, the next slide is more of the kind of medical school uh, breakdown here. But we discussed this, we see the mechanotransduction, um, role in senescence or zombie cells that are taking up biomass, although they aren't, uh, performing functions anymore. And so um, and so I, I think we covered this well, but this is just a slide for your reference that, that can kind of help illustrate. So yeah, thank you. Next page is uh, now the long haul COVID syndrome. So uh, we've, we've probably seen, I, I don't know if you've seen this in the office, but patients who uh, seemingly recovered from either primary exposure to COVID uh, had uh, PASC or um, they develop post-COVID sy syndromes. And I'm going to take a quick quick uh, detour again about my origin story here and then tie it back again because I've worked for clinics that focus on long COVID and then focus uh, and have collaborated with uh, people like Bruce Patterson who have pioneered uh, the use of Maraviroc. Uh, he is a Stanford uh, head of ID. And so he did pioneering work and was one of the first to use a highly active antiretroviral therapy to treat HIV and AIDS patients. And it's interesting, uh, we're not going to go deeply into the classical monocyte pathways and, and so forth, but um, I just wanted to give you all hope because, you know, I've certainly worked with some of the leading clinics um, to try to elucidate that th this, this final common pathway between diseases such as post-mold, post-Lyme, post-COVID, right? Because everyone's going to present with brain fog. Everyone's going to present with malaise, a decreased ability to concentrate, even sometimes to the point that they're losing their jobs and they're losing their families just because of not just the um, medical or clinical impact or toll, but based on their economic resources of, of being able to keep up with all of this. And so... Um, one thing I've noticed that, that is missing that I'm hoping this conversation will start to shift the dialogue is that we can start to take all this knowledge and help patients build the good back. 
as I said, because there are so many rabbit holes, and you'll see shortly as we go through this. Um, but oftentimes, I've seen patients who've gone to uh, some of the top functional medicine providers and have gone to Hopkins and Cleveland Clinic and Penn and have been ruled out or ruled in as it may be, it doesn't really matter because they come back with either rule out POTS, rule, or, rule out either downloads, rule out chronic line. You know, they've uh, been seen by the top doctors who follow the IDSA guidelines. They've been seen by the top docs that follow Horowitz or Neil Nathan or um, the Shoemaker or Dr. Heyman. I mean, I've worked with these people. And the point though, however, is that there are many rabbit holes that we can go into. Um, and I think we're making exciting developments uh, with many tools that are available now that weren't before. But what I'm hoping to leave you with is not to be overwhelmed. Certainly, um, I just took my functional medicine boards and I know the pressure that can occur when there is not necessarily a connect between the books and podcasts that we're listening to and our patient story and the tools that we have available. But what I hope to emphasize is, again, by building the good, by putting the credits back into that 401k. Unfortunately, a lot of people need quantified information and a quantified self to make those action points. But I'm hoping that today through my with my colleagues and my amazing team, Dr. Bruno Stag, Lisa, Susie, we're gonna give you some more tools in your toolkit. So uh, COVID's effect on microcirculation. We've all seen patients, unfortunately, I had one patient that ended up being on hemodialysis um, and developing uh, basically kidney uh, failure as a result, the only change being COVID. Um, again, we can debate about causation and correlation, but to me, my only interest is in the making the patient in front of me stronger and healthier and happier. And so, you know, I think that uh, certainly I've seen patients who have developed heart failure uh, as a result of the only temporal chronological event being uh, a COVID. And so uh, we're now starting to ask the right questions and we certainly developed a lot more knowledge we didn't have before. We know that long haul COVID is associated with profound effects on microcirculation. Uh, microcirculation is uh, simply the small blood vessel network that delivers oxygen nutrients to and organ tissues and organs. And so there's several mechanisms that have been proposed that contribute to this microcirculatory dysfunction. Uh, they are endothelial dysfunction, microfibrosis, and an inflammatory response. So we know that the endothelium is a single layer of cells that line the blood vessels and is critically important to regulating vascular function. And we know that long COVID can lead to endothelial dysfunction that's characterized by impaired nitric oxide production. Uh, and nitric oxide production is important for vasodilation. And so you basically end up with reduced blood flow leading to tissue hypoxia and organ dysfunction. The second is microthrombosis. Long haul COVID has been associated with hypercoagulable states. So they will basically be predisposed to uh, developing microthrombosis and tiny blood clots within their small blood vessels that obstruct blood flow, leading to tissue ischemia and inflammation. The third is inflammatory response. So persistent inflammation from the SARS-CoV-2 virus will basically contribute to microvascular damage, which leads to chronic activation of the immune system, leading to endothelial activation and dysfunction, which exacerbates microcirculatory impairment. And so you really have oil on fire. And so that's why the long haul COVID syndrome is, is going to they pretty much have a pervasive impact. Uh, and you see the PAM positive review of systems. Persistent fatigue, dyspnea, shortness of breath, cognitive dysfunction, issues with memory with uh, short term and long term, and also even forming new memories uh, and word finding. Um, very troublesome signs. And so there is even now, as we're seeing, a potential for long term organ damage and part, uh, cardiac, pulmonary, and neurological complications. And so let's go to the next slide. Um, this is just a, a, a nice illustration that I got from the Annals of Intensive Care that basically show you, again, the, the progressive effects of uh, long haul COVID on microcirculation that can ultimately re result in macroscopic and organ damage. So we covered a lot. Let's go into the case because to me, um, if I were sitting where you are, that's a TMI. And so I like to use cases um, and think about patients for whom this could actually be, be applicable. So 
remember how I told you that the biomarkers and the imaging and even using a functional medicine approach, uh, sometimes it's like more pieces to the puzzle, but without the frame, you know, it, it, again, we have to be able to connect the dots. And so this patient, as you can see, uh, I would say is, is pretty much more of a typical, um, what I would call periandropausal male, because in our practice, we do BHRT. We also do um, aesthetic uh, treatment because we believe people should look the way they feel and feel the way they, they look. And we know there's a whole field of psychodermatology. And so we have a typical, I would say, patient who's having kind of what, like, could you imagine a woman in menopause with uh, decreased libido, decreased energy, um, and some some reductions in exercise capacity, quality of life metrics, essentially, but nothing really uh, outstanding in terms of a review of systems. Like, typical, I would say a typical, pretty typical patient, problems with sleeping, a high-stress job as a uh, founder of a property management company, and 18 employees, um, and three grown children, um, really kind of uh, self-educated as far as functional medicine and taking, uh, you know, D3, B12 multivitamins. Um, and, you know, a, more of a distant history of hypertension and asthma and some depression, but not taking any regular pharmacologic therapy um, and some, some allergies, some food allergies and some environmental allergies. And so uh, for the next slide, please. Thank you. He, uh, as, as you can see, had a various uh, questionable allergy to iodinated contrast um, and penicillin sulfa rash and tree nut causing hives. Um, in terms of um, supplements, uh, this was part of the treatment plan that was initially um, that was initiated when we first saw him. Some cardiovascular support, TMG, methyl folate. Um, I know it's a little bit of out of order, but I need to get to the main meat of this because in our practice, we like to give people again, even without labs, we, we it's very important to get, get them informed consent, but it's very difficult to overdose on things that we are known to be deficient in. I mean, things that are uh, available in multi minerals um, like magnesium and uh, lithium and so forth. And so, this was uh, what I would call basic uh, functional medicine 1.0. Just, uh, you know, he had some libido issues and some uh, decreased quality of erections. And so he was placed on initial start, starting dose of testosterone while PSA and also um, all of his uh, hormone markers were, were pending. Uh, he was, again, started on a basically a basic cardiovascular support protocol with some omegas and some K2 um, and D uh, and TMG and so forth. And so, um, again, basic things, kind of trying to reduce uh, simple carbs and reduce some glycemic index, trying to increase uh, body composition, uh, typical skinny fat with increased uh, visceral adiposity, uh, but, but some muscle um, sarcopenia uh, due to, uh, again, lack of energy, vicious cycle, as I mentioned, with that 401k. And so we also did a risk stratification with coronary calcium score. Uh, and, and so uh, and we'll go to the next slide. Thank you. And again, this is a little out of order, but this is my belief, again, causation and correlation, because in real practice, it doesn't always happen that we have all the conventional labs first, and then we add on the functional medicine lab. Sometimes there's some overlap, but you'll see um, anemia markers were fine. Um, nutrition markers, D was you know, pretty low normal. And vitamin B12, uh, it's in kind of middle, but suboptimal. And so next page, please. Thank you. And so um, we can see that in terms of his uh, autoimmunity markers, his uh, he was negative for RF and CCP3. His CRP put him at a moderate risk. Uh, in his next page, his ANA was negative, so his body was not forming uh, generalized antibodies and not tissue specific was the nuclei and cells which is great. His lipoprotein markers did show a high risk as uh, small dense LDL particles. LP little a was 13. Uh, making a control. Thank you. Um, and so, yeah, so a little bit of dyslipidemia, a little bit of inflammation. As you can see, he had a basically suboptimal um, uh, ApoB and his plaque score uh, showing soft plaque uh, tissue burden was elevated, but nothing too crazy. I mean, I'm sure we've all seen much worse labs. And so, uh, you know, there's some vascular stress with his homocysteine being in moderate range. Again, there's that CRP moderate 
oxidize LDL was okay. So let's go to the next page, please. And so A1C, again, um, pre-diabetes, and so kind of consistent, nothing too surprising um, from, from that perspective. So next page, his insulin was fine. His thyroid was, was fine. Um, his T3 could have used a little bit of improvement, but he certainly did not have any uh, antibodies to his thyroid TPO and, and thyroglobulin uh, normal uh, reverse T3. Uh, you know, elevated during times of stress and starvation because the body does not want to convert uh, storage T4 to active T3. Most of our cells have thyroid receptors, and his was in the high normal range. And so consistent definitely with his uh, story. Next page, please. Uh, CMP, not uh, anything significant in dental maybe um, low uh, mildly decreased sodium but otherwise normal uh, renal electrolyte and liver function markers of oxidative stress ast and alt uh, which are great uh, next page please um, and hormonally testosterone certainly you zero in on that with his libido issues his periandropausal issues his erectile issues and certainly could be optimized um, and so um really focusing on that cortisol, not a great marker. I like to use the four point salivary cortisol to see what their velocity and their response is in terms of their adrenal function. Uh, certainly DHEA could be improved, uh, you know, and given its role in testosterone production and given its role in uh, just in terms of stress uh, homeostasis, but otherwise nothing too, too outstanding. So, so far, not bad, I would say a B plus um or a minus next page cbc not bad um often you know we're in colorado so we see a lot of people a little bit of hemoconcentration concentration due to the altitude but overall nothing significant in terms of anemia in terms of white red blood cell and take that counts and so everything looked good um next page his psa was normal it's fine that's good because prior to starting testosterone therapy we have to make sure and uh, get a baseline psa so look good. Next page, please. Uh, uric acid, a little bit elevated. Um, you know, we use IGF-1 as a surrogate marker for growth hormone, which is pulse to hard to measure, so not bad. Uh, cystatin C and GGT, specific markers for uh, kidney and liver function, respectively, were within normal limits. And next page, please. Thank you. And so here we have his omega index. Clearly, you could use some improvement. And again, this is, again, I encourage for people, uh, certainly, having kind of seen the landscape of functional medicine from what I call functional medicine 2.0 practices, people like uh, Dr. Heyman and people like Dr. Shoemaker who are using metabolomics and transcriptomics and proteomics to look at uh, actual uh, genetic pathways and how those are altered by uh, biotoxic illness. Um, I mean, those are specialized practices that require um, a dedicated staff, I would say, and, and dedicated kind of protocols um, but, and, but you have patients, uh, again, where you, you give them what their body needs. You give them the stretch rate. And the body is generally, most of the time, I'm not going to quantify it, but I'll say in most of the patients I've seen, that paradigm shift has radically changed um, outcomes for patients because you give them, in this case, like testosterone, and they're having sex again with their uh, boyfriend or girlfriend or, or husband or wife, you know, they're enjoying intimacy again. Well, you're going to get two birds with one stone because now they're exercising again and they're having partner intimacy. So it's a win. You give them a little bit of T3 um, or you give them a combined T4, T3 for those who are naive to uh, thyroid replacement therapy. It's like night and day. As I said, most cells have a thyroid receptor. And so people with global dysfunction, um, I have to admit, I was skeptical for a long time. Uh, until I started taking and following my own advice, do as I say, not as I do. And I've gained 10 pounds of muscle in the last year. You might not be able to see that by, by looking at me, but patients, <clears throat> don't forget that patients are, are looking uh, to role model after their provider. And if you're a smoking cardiologist and you're telling people to quit smoking, it's kind of paradoxical. And so I have many patients that will kind of just ask me, what am I doing? And so I don't have to sell them anymore, kind of, you know, the validity of this. I don't have to say, oh, I went to Hopkins and I worked with the thought leaders. I become, uh, you know, knowing the reasons why really helps motivate. You become the health coach and health coaching is a burgeoning industry. But if you can become that cheerleader and as well as their uh, as shepherd and help guide them through all of these, uh, this complicated landscape, I mean, they will, they will be follow you uh, for the rest of your life. I mean, I, 
and, and I've certainly seen that bear borne out. So let's go to the next page, please. Um, so uh, he, we did the CSC score, uh, and the CSC score was zero. Uh, incidental note, uh, as we come and see, the incidental loma, the two millimeter right upper lobe nodule, but as you know, these are often just kind of monitored uh, for interval changes, and there were no suspicious features. Uh, the rest of the cardiopulmonary uh, imaging findings were within normal limits and some minimal arthritis. Uh, degenerative changes with the rest of the spine. Uh, next page, again, uh, confirms the, the findings. Next page, please. Um, great, thank you. So as you can see, there's a nodule. And so everything basically, there was no coronary artery calcification. So let's go to the next page. So he came in initially, I believe this was on the slide, yes. He came in February 26. He called the office and the office staff notified me that the patient had had a left temporal headache for five days. His blood pressures uh, ambulatorily were ranging from systolic 180 to 200 and diastolic 90 to 100. When I spoke to him, he denied cardiopulmonary symptoms. And this is important, I didn't put this here, but um, as we often see, it's usually the wife that comes in first. As we know, autoimmunity predominantly affects women and then they bring their husbands well guess what his wife told him to please do what he ultimately decided that he was going to do which is call us to um you know get get some insight into what was going to happen and so given the uh, blood pressures given the headaches and concern for potential uh and organ involvement i advised him and spoke about one and a half to two hours with him on the phone to bring him from kind of pre-contemplation to contemplation to action. And so um, this is where I want to talk about briefly the spiritual aspect of the functional medicine approach. I think too often we forget that sometimes that's really all they have. And many patients that uh, I was in inner city Baltimore and I remember having this conversation with my friend who's a neurosurgeon there. He's now a vascular attending. Um, he specializes in subarachnoid hemorrhages. And he was saying, you know, I respect you for the most part, you know, you're, you're, um, you know, clearly passionate about what you do. He said, but I don't understand how you can be intelligent and then believe in God or a higher power. And so I told him that, you know, first of all, Ben Carson is a Johns Hopkins alum, um, as you know, uh, who famously prayed before each of his um, cases. Um, and I do strongly believe um, without stepping on anybody's toes in your belief. But the fact is, it's not about you, right? As I told him, it's about the patient. In inner city Baltimore, a lot of those patients have huge socioeconomic stressors. I mean, I'm about to uh, enlist in the army. And one of the quotes that I like that I want to share with you is very simple. It's pressure is privilege. And so the fact that we can even worry about things means that we are basically uh, attended to in terms of Maslow's hierarchy. You know, we have enough to eat, we have enough uh, to wear. Um, we don't have to worry about where we're going to sleep. But for many people, spirit is really all they have left. It's the things that are not of this world. And so I've actually also found that people who are the most happy, and there are many, many studies, which we're not going to go into here, which correlate spiritual health with physical health. And so mind, body, spirit. And so it turned out that after that two hour conversation, it wasn't anything that he didn't already know. And so that's really humbling me to me every time. It doesn't matter if I have 15 minutes of Hopkins seeing 30 to 40 patients, or if I'm seeing two to three patients and spending two to three hours per patient. The fact is it's, all, it's always about number one, asking the right question, number two, building the relationship. Because once you have that, and that's David Rakel's work, right? In integrative medicine, where the relationship is the central part. You could be the smartest person in the world. Just like when I used to be a young medical resident telling patients to quit smoking and they promptly went to the parking lot and lit up a cigarette because I just pressed all their buttons and stressed them out and told them everything that they're, that they already knew. And so I simply told him that, you know, if I were him, I, I really pulled out the big guns. I said, look, you, you know, nobody can make you anything, do anything. And of course you got to chart this, that patient was given full informed consent about risk benefits and alternatives. Um, but I fully just spelled it out that if I were you, this is what I would do. But ultimately, nobody can know, and, and we don't have an EKG. We don't have the ability to do troponins here. Uh, I would if I could, but first and foremost, do no harm. 
Second, honor your autonomy. Third, beneficence, try to do what's best. And so I was using medical legal terminology, maybe projecting a little bit, but ultimately I told him the great physician is already within you. Like your body has been telling you something for five days and none of us here are God. So there's no way that I can just do a CT scan from, from here over there. We don't have that technology yet. So promptly go to urgent care for evaluation. And he later told me when he came in, which I'll tell you, is that when I the key thing that changed his needle wasn't his wife and it wasn't me. It was my my belief resonated with his that there's a great physician that's not here, and and he happened to believe that super strongly. So he went promptly to the uh, urgent care. Let's go to the next page. Urgent care found that his his, his blood pressures mirrored uh, his ambulatory ones at home, and so he was sent to the emergency room at Colo- um, University of Colorado. There, as you can see from the HPI, his blood pressure at the ER was found to be 220 over 130. A cardiac workup and therefore rule out MI was instituted, so ER protocols were initiated. Because of his iodine contrast allergy, he was premedicated with Benadryl. Let's go to the next page, please. His physical exam was uh, completely unremarkable, including a Glasgow Como score of 15. So he had no focal neurological deficits. There was no sign of end organ damage. There was no papilledema noted by the provider, which is great. Um, let's move to the next page. Similarly, uh, he had unremarkable labs, including troponin times one that was negative CBC and CMP within nor- I'm sorry, BMP within normal limits. And his EKG is interesting because uh, of course, I, as I teach my Hopkins medical students, it's not about reading the machine interpretation. You have to still remember. And so let's go. Unfortunately, I don't have the EKG because these days it's all digital. But um, his EKG did show the only thing, if you were to pin your hat on something, is he had sort of normal sinus rhythm. Um, his There was a probable left atrial enlargement based on if you, if you see the EKG. Yeah, you see the EKG. So if you look at the P wave, you'll see that his was uh, his PR interval was 167. So that's one hallmark of potential left atrial enlargement. Um, and also he did have a P wave axis deviation, his being 61. And so greater, sorry, let me move back quickly. So normal PR, as you might recall, is 0.12 uh, seconds or 120 milliseconds. And then the P wave, uh, Anything greater than 60 degrees, his was 61. So he barely kind of met the threshold there. Um, so maybe light left atrial enlargement indicating stress over for chronic hypertension and therefore, uh, you know, a ventricular hypertrophy and remodeling us slightly. Um, but otherwise, morphology, left axis deviation, atrial fibrillation, there were no indications of that, which can be associated with, um, with, uh, excuse me, sorry, with uh, left atrial enlargement. So let's go to the next page. So this is where the, the million dollar question, remember headache for five days, temporal arteritis definitely reaches the differential uh, ischemic versus uh, probably not hemorrhagic, but CVA and so forth. So a CT of the head without IV contrast, CTA of the neck and head was performed. Uh, there was nothing significant to note other than he had, as you can see, not on this page, uh, there was a mild luminal and irregular, excuse me, irregularity of the right carotid. There was non-calcified plaque, but we saw he had a little bit of a um, elevated plaque score. So that's that's good that it correlated here. The next page, uh, CTA of the neck, uh, normal carotids, which is good. Uh, then the vertebral artery high. <clears throat> if you notice, I didn't highlight it. Apologize, but if you look at the first sentence of vertebral arteries, you'll see that it's left dominant. His symptoms were left-sided, temporal headache, remember, and a focal high-grade narrowing of the left vertebral artery due to partially calcified plaque. Uh, and, and multifocal luminal regularities were noticed. Um, chest x-ray was uh, within normal limits. Uh, normal silhouette, no cardiomegaly, normal lungs, no pneumothorax. And so, yeah, so that's, that's the case. And I think that's my main takeaway is, um, again, this patient had no significant, even on functional medicine testing, um, major, major risk factors. And it wasn't like he was a huge smoker. It wasn't like he was terribly sedentary. He's where I'd say most of the population is nowadays in terms of the new normal. But um, again, uh, kind of the principle of doing no harm, have we kind of just said, oh, everything's fine based on labs. I think 
it's an important cautionary tale that even with all these additional tools, we don't want to be complacent and say labs are normal, therefore not forget and, and forget about all of the pathophysiology, the differential diagnosis and doing no harm. So thinking of the worst case scenario, but also the best case scenario and uh, trying to, again, do what, what's best for the patient to the best of our ability. So that concludes my uh, presentation part. Um, these slides have already been kind of oh, spoken okay. about. How are we doing time, everyone? Is, there, is it okay? Good. I think we're, yeah, we're over on time, uh, but that's okay. We'll open it up for some questions as I just kind of land here. So I'm gonna scroll up to maybe our first question. Um, and so, um, Go ahead and stay if you're able to stay, everyone. Um, okay, and so Dr. Chen, can you see the screen? I can read the question out loud, but I did share it to the screen to see. So um, um, Dr. Drews was asking, um, there are no human studies um, to my knowledge on the role of the glycocalyx um, as an integrative cardiologist, find limited data supporting interventions aimed at the glycocalyx for clinical outcomes and would like you to comment. Yeah, and so definitely coming, let me see. Um, I did have references on all my slides. So I, I made sure to heavily reference my slides because of my preparation for things like this. Of course, I told you that I love to learn and so um, if you go back to the, let me see, page, uh, the impact of oxidative stress on the glycocalyx, I believe that's, um, it's right after my, my slide with the electron microscopy and, uh, and, yeah. uh, Garfield, that, that page that introduces the glycocalyx, there are three references there. Um, one was from circulation research, the other's current um, opinions in the pathology, the third was microvascular research. Um, you know, I, I agree with you about uh, incorporating evidence. There was a point at Hopkins where I actually wanted to have essentially a bibliography in my patient studies, just because by the time, for the patient to be a no-show, they would have to be beyond 15 minutes late. So there were times where they were 17 minutes late, but still brought back because they weren't technically 17, 17 minutes late. But from a risk management perspective, that's actually frowned upon um, because there may be uh, a point that doesn't um, support uh, and could be used against you if, if there is an adverse outcome. So back to your question, certainly I'd love to, um, my information can, you're welcome to kind of contact me through, uh, through the team here and i would love to continue this dialogue because certainly i've been here for about a year at this practice and i have not found any integrated the only preventive cardiologists that i know of are in, in florida i don't know if anybody here can comment on and i know certainly i've tried to collaborate with dr houston who is um internist i don't believe he's an actual cardiologist but he is considered a subject matter expert and a thought leader in lipidology and, and things like this um but it's actually super difficult to find because uh, cardiologists, as you know, it's people like Dr. Guarneri, uh, who I've been fortunate to be mentored, is one of the pioneers in integrative car cardiology. Um, they start out as interventionalists just because you're not paid for prevention. And so um, let's start by please review the um, references. I know they were small, so I, I take responsibility for that uh, on, on my slides. But I certainly I have... Uh, the references on on that slide and let me see there's there's more references before on the slide before that it, that are associated with let's see endothelial glycocalyx composition functions and visualization uh the glycocalyx and the significance in human medicine um certainly uh, when i have patients that came in uh, you know my best teachers are, are not uh harrison's manual medicine they're they're my patients and so I've gone and looked at, if you listen to people like Peter Atia, and you listen to people like Andrew Huberman, who regardless of what you may think about them, um, I know Peter Atia allegedly is charging $250,000 for virtual consultation for his first patients um, through friends and colleagues that work with him. Uh, I know Andrew Huberman has been in the news recently as well. Um, but the fact of the matter is that uh, many quote RCTs, um, the principal investigators, I believe this is a major paper, which I'm not sure if you read this paper, that um, the gold standard, quote unquote, of the randomized control trial, that I think less than half 
of which is less than chance, as we know from probability, of those hypotheses and the null hypotheses can be reproduced. And so that's one of the key. First, the key question is, are we asking the right question, right? We know from pharmaceutical studies, pretty much you can create a study to validate any point you make. So partially it's due to the um, integrity of the study design and the randomization and so forth. And that goes beyond the context of this this conversation. But I certainly uh, done a lot of soul searching with this. And um, I'll frankly use my experience. And we're going to talk about this next week, this symphony of endocrine hormones. I just came back from the A4M hormones conference a few months ago, uh, where on the stage, even among the faculty of A4M, which differs from IFM in its approach and in, in terms of its protocols and paradigms, because ultimately you'll see some similar patterns where you have faculty that are either sponsored for, so they'll either put that in their disclosures, their speaker disclosures, uh, but they are working with, uh, let's say, uh, a particular lab or a particular nutraceutical company. So you do start to see a similar kind of pattern where, um, I'm trying to choose my words delicately, you know, there was no concordance. I was at a hormones conference. So the hormones conference is to bring, give you tools for people like me, as well as people who have never done hormone uh, replacement, have never done testosterone replacement therapy or estradiol or progesterone or pregnenolone therapy or DHEA supplementation. And some were focusing heavily. Um, and these are original pioneers. Um, so you had you have people on stage who are advocating for serum testing. You had people on the stage for every reason that they were advocating for benefits of serum testing, they were advocating saliva testing. Then you had people who were looking at your urinary metabolites. So I was able to follow and track the conversation because to me, if you're using your evidence base as the Women's Health Initiative study, again, back from the 1970s, where they, to pick up, to show power, had to choose a population that had multiple risk factors they were smokers they were people with copd they were not healthy like i said this patient here they were not andrew perry andropausal they were not perimenopausal you know um and and however the studies are going to be published because they are actually you know of course their endpoint unfortunately the takeaway has damaged people which which i'm sure you've seen they're clearly perimenopausal and the response has always to be on long-term oral contraceptive therapy, which is usually a mix of estrogen and progestins. And that is tied to risk of venous thromboembolism. That is tied to risk of breast cancer. So this is going to be talked about next week. Um, but I would certainly love to continuing, uh, or sorry, continue that dialogue and conversation um, with, with the person that asked that question. And I appreciate that question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and we got an email address for you. I'll give it to you offline so that you can um, talk with Dr. Drews about that. Uh, she did also okay. have a follow-up question. Um, how we isolate the glycocalyx specifically as it the interface given that oxidative stress impacts us through the immune inflammatory system resulting in a release of IL-1, IL-6, both involved with the inflammation amplification loops. Um, would this be part of the, I think you had a slide here, right? With the measuring evaluation methods. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, that's right. Okay. Uh, that's a really good question. And again, I, I think that goes back to my, um, original supposition. You're right. I mean, that's why the, if you look at, Cle I've been following the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine. I don't know if you have been, but they're trying to, they're, they're not trying to prove, um, like this discussion we're having is kind of super, super, super advanced. It's almost like electron microscopy. I feel like they're still at the light microscopy stage. They're trying to set the stage. So they're, they're not doing the initial studies on, say, um, microbiome. I think they're looking at cardiometabolic syndrome, like what I just described here, and how a functional medicine approach can help you create precision in terms of a treatment plan that's personalized and, and preventive and proactive. And the reason why we're all here um, and as, as, as you're pointing out, I mean, I've certainly had calls with Dr. Patterson, who I spoke about before, with Dr. Bruno, I believe, right? Dr. Bruno, we were on this call where we yeah. were kind of looking at interleukins and cytokines and classical monocytes. It's very complex. And he's using artificial intelligence, interestingly enough, because I know there's a debate even about that, garbage in, garbage out. And so... The Cleveland Clinic, to my point, is not doing uh, the simple, it's not doing questions based on is there an enzyme deficiency or is there a classical 
pharmacologic therapy and what is the proposed hypothesis and what is the, the uh, no hypothesis for that intervention. The intervention is, um, as Dr. I think it's Dr. Dr. Hannaway has mentioned, who who worked with Dr. Hyman at the Cleveland Clinic. It's it's all of these things. Like we know, exercise increases T helper ones, but how does that correlate with an actual uh, change in your autoimmunity? Like these are really good questions, and um, you know, frankly, I I don't know the answer. I, I'm happy to um, try to look, look, but I'm not a cardiologist again. Sometimes I think I want to stay in my lane. But if, if the people I, I see who have already gone to reproductive endocrinology, or in this case, if, if he had gone the conventional way and gone to cardiology and gone to vascular surgery, no one would be having the conversation about what are his other options that are non-conventional um, because it's really David and Goliath here. But the more I learn, I'll be frank with you. I mean, the, the less I feel like we know and the more we need to work together to try to elucidate this. So certainly, um, you know, I wish these questions, if you all know, this is what in Hopkins we, we call flipping the classroom, because I'm here just to speak about this topic, but obviously um, it's creating kind of boundaries on a topic that has no end. I mean, we could literally just probably debate, the, and I've seen um, kind of converse, uh, debates between uh, conventional cardiologists and integrative cardiologists, and you've got kind of panels that represent each perspective but, but see, this is what I want to change. That's why I love Johns Hopkins. I love Johns Hopkins because I want to create a space where we can have a dialogue without um, patients really being affected because ultimately, at the end of the day, the patient really doesn't care about how much you know. They care about your ability to connect with them. And evidence is one of those things. The second is autonomy, like, right? A lot of patients are simply not getting informed consent. They go to cardiologists and, and, and even, I don't know what your story is, but it's impossible to practice integrative or functional, whatever you want to call it in a conventional setting. There, it's just impossible because so much is education. And so, um, All yeah, right. let's, let's Dr. Dr. Up. Chen, I'm going to stop you there just because we're pretty far over time, but thank oh, okay. you. Yeah. Thank you everyone for your engagement today and your questions. I know you guys had a nice conversation happening in the chat. And thank you for answering questions to your fellow um, colleagues too. That's always really helpful because we do learn from everybody in the room. Um, thank you everyone for your um, for joining today. You will get a copy of these slides. Um, and then next week, Dr. Chen will be talking about the endocrine um, impacts of oxidative stress. And then after that, we'll pull it all together with some case studies. We're starting to see a lot of live results coming in with the panel that launched um, and be able to pull that all together. So we really appreciate your engagement today um, and we'll see you again next week. Thank you so much.